tender. Chased by the deep state, fighting for independence, thinking about revolution, looking for alternative solutions. The enemies of the deep state will tell you what others even don't dare to think. Manuel Oxenreiter and Mateusz Piskorski. Hello, hello, hello. This is the podcast, The Guten Menschen, Public Enemies of the Deep State. My name is Manuel Ochsenreiter. I'm editor-in-chief of the German news magazine Zuerst. And on the other side is again Mateusz Piskorski, my friend and colleague from Poland. Hello, Mateusz. Hello, Manuel, and hello to everyone. So today we speak again, and uh, who would have thought weeks ago that we still speak about Belarus? Because when I was checking our media some weeks ago when the elections were uh, in uh, Minsk and in Belarus, it sounded like the country will see a regime change within several days. And uh, we can say until today, really, nothing so far happened. What are the news from there? Well, first and foremost, uh, we have a very important meeting uh, between uh, the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, and uh, the Belarusian uh, president, his counterpart, uh, Alexander Lukashenko, uh, which is uh, really of high importance because I think that uh, from the purely geopolitical uh, point of view, Moscow was uh, the only capital, uh, at least when it comes to the neighboring countries, which was... Uh, uh, well, uh, truly understanding what is going on and what is happening there in Belarus, and uh, which uh, completely understood the danger springing out of uh, the, let's say, planned uh, color revolution there. So, uh, from the geopolitical point of view, uh, after the period when uh, the Belarusian authorities tried to, let's say, uh, convey a kind of uh, multi Di multi-direction uh, external policy, like, you know, discussing everything with the, with the West and then negotiating with China and then coming mm -hmm. to Russia and uh, other countries. Now, uh, Belarus will be completely oriented on uh, Russia and uh, the further in uh, integration with uh, Russia within the uh, common state of uh, Russia and Belarus, which is already existing officially formerly since uh, the 90s, but uh, now it will be something, let's say, more real and more mm, uh, actually functioning, yes. Uh, so uh, the result, uh, well, it's quite, it, it might uh, sound quite strange, but the result, geopolitical result of uh, uh, all this operation uh, prepared by, by the West or by certain forces in the West, is uh, uh, even more and more close cooperation between uh, Moscow and Minsk. I don't think they expected such a result, but uh, that this, is, is, this would be the real outcome. Isn't, that isn't, isn't, isn't that precisely that what the West wanted to prevent? Yeah, to exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we heard, I mean, uh, uh, Lukashenko was uh, uh, in, uh, in the last... Uh, during the last 10 years, yes, pr practically during the last 10 years, uh, particularly he was, uh, uh, let's say, trying to trying to avoid an, uh, let's say, single uh, orientation in uh, his foreign policy on uh, only one center. So he he was really trying to uh, think about a kind of um, multidimensional, uh, diversified uh, external policy. Uh, which is now finished, actually, yes, because he, of the West. He was, yeah, he was doing some kind of swing policy, sometimes closer to the Russian Federation, sometimes uh, closer to Europe. Uh, was that a thing, for example, what also uh, Yanukovych tried uh, in Ukraine uh, for a certain while? Exactly, but uh, in case of uh, Yanukovych, uh, well... Uh, Things cannot be compared, of course, because uh, the internal political system and economic system of Ukraine was completely different than the one of Belarus. Uh, so uh, in the uh, case of Ukraine, it's not uh, Yanukovych and his people who decided about all those directions, but uh, more 
the oligarchs who are trying to to control the situation yes as a whole so uh, in this particular case we have a kind of sovereign uh, independent choice of political leadership mm. contrary to ukraine uh, which was actually and which is run by oligarchs and uh, external agents of influence when it when it comes to the relations between uh, belarus and the russian federation i mean there were really times in the past when everyone thought that um, these two countries might really go in a kind of union again and i mean not just the union on the paper um, as it as it was but in a, a real union like a, well like a federation what what happened to that idea and this this idea now due to the events uh, becoming again more realistic well the idea is there since uh, 24 years at least yes yeah um, i don't know if uh, if you remember the story from 1996 which was quite interesting when uh, lukashenko tried to uh, become the leader the president of the new unified completely politically unified uh, state Uh, uniting Belarus and Russia. That was quite interesting because he had, uh, uh, let's say, uh, ambitions which were uh, quite uh, bigger than just 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 being a president, a head of uh, Belarusian state. At that time, uh, in times of uh, weak and uh, well, uh, <laughs> let's say, uh, driven by alcoholism, uh, Yeltsin. Yes, <laughs> uh, we had. Uh, uh, Lukashenko had an opportunity and even a plan, as some claim, to become a president of a superpower, yes? It was uh, back in 1996, uh, I remember that then uh, Lukashenko proposed a new constitution for a common state of uh, Russia and Belarus. And uh, according to this uh, draft uh, constitution, uh, half of the members of the parliamentary assembly of the new state would come from Belarus and uh, half from uh, Russia. Uh, so no one would have a majority. Uh, but uh, Yeltsin uh, did not notice that Lukashenko had already made some arrangements with uh, the Russian communists, mm -hmm. which, mean, which means that uh, he would have the majority in the parliamentary assembly of the common state and that he could uh, very easily become a president then, yes, back then, <laughs> of, um, of the common uh, Russian Belarusian state. Uh, that was back in 1996. Of course, the situation is completely different now. Nevertheless, uh, I think that Russia needs uh, Belarus for strategic reason, reasons, as well as, of course, Belarus uh, needs Russia. Uh, just simply, we, if we look at the geoeconomic, geostrategic uh, aspects and ties, uh, it becomes quite obvious. So I don't think that uh, other geopolitical options are possible here. Uh, we have heard uh, from the experts before the meeting, first meeting after the elections between uh, Putin and Lukashenko that, uh, for instance, there are very far-reaching plans to create common armed forces of uh, Russia and Belarus to completely unify uh, the military policy of both countries, uh, which means that it will be also a kind of guarantee Uh, for Russia, that Belarus, uh, in uh, different political uh, situations and obstacles, will not become the part of any pro-NATO uh, Western alliance, uh, uh, let's say, directed against Moscow. Yes? So, so uh, this is crucial for the safety of uh, both partners, I think. When we look now to the events uh, during Well, during the protests and uh, if we take a look at the so-called opposition in Minsk, um, we can see attempts by the West to replace Lukashenko from outside. Uh, I think we can see there a parallel to countries, for example, such as uh, lately Venezuela, but also uh, with Syria in 2011-2012, when uh, Western countries simply declared they won't recognize the legal leadership of a country as the legal leadership 
and um, simply um, decided to recognize someone else. So we have the example in uh, Syria with the so-called democratic opposition. These were then the guys who were sitting in the hotels in Istanbul um, and were uh, somehow acting like they would be the government. And we have it in Venezuela with uh, Gaudo, who, <laughs> who was all of a sudden recognized as uh, a president, despite the fact that Maduro is the president. Do we have a similar, um, at least, attempt in, in Belarus as well, I think, if we see what is happening there, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, well, you, you have mentioned Syria, so I remember that... Uh, at a certain moment, the only embassy of Syria, I mean of the legal Syrian authorities in uh, Europe was, uh, if I'm not wrong, the embassy of Syria to Poland. Because as far as I remember, the, the embassy of Syria in Germany it was taken by the so-called opposition. Yes. No, 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 no. They tried. They tried to storm it. The embassy. The embassy was uh, staying firmly with the government, but it was uh, non-stop attacked and there were attempts to overrun it, literally overrun it by people. And, <laughs> and well, these are, these are the jokes of history. I think that was the moment when the German police forces defended the legal, <laughs> the legal Syrian government. Or so. ah, the <laughs> Germans have, uh, have been always on the legalist position. Of course, <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> As a tradition, politically. <laughs> yes. uh, anyway, uh, anyway, most of the embassies, uh, most of the embassies were uh, taken, uh, regardless of the fact that they are, and they are, and they were at that time uh, public property of, of the Syrian state. They were taken by some uh, undefined uh, opposition forces, and they have even created a kind of. Uh, I mean, they were pretending that they are still uh, diplomats, ambassadors, and so on. Mm. So. That was the Syrian case. The Venezuelan case was even more interesting. Uh, back in 2018, the, the speaker of uh, the former speaker of the Venezuelan parliament, Juan Guaido, was uh, nominated actually by the United States as a, as an acting president and recognized president of Venezuela. Mm. Uh, of course, uh, it was quite funny because uh, he had no control over the administration, over, over the government. Uh, so uh, it was just a kind of, uh, uh, you know, show for, for, for the international public opinion. Nevertheless, uh, officially, I think that, uh, again, most of the European Union countries also joined the United States and they recognize Guaido as a Venezuelan president. Uh, no one knows actually where Guaido is now and what is he doing because uh, almost everyone has, has forgotten about this guy. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there was such a moment. And uh, now we have uh, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, which has been also uh, identified and recognized by uh, the Lithuanian parliament lately as an acting president of Belarus. She, yeah. She's right now in Litu Lithuania, right? Uh, or, yes, yes, yeah, yes I, she lives there. So, so the, the, the Belarusian president, according to Lithuanian authorities, uh, is a resident of Lithuania. It's a, it's a, per, it's a permanent uh, state guest, uh, as it seems. Yes, 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 it seems like that. Nevertheless, of course, it's, it, it might look funny, yes, but uh, on the other hand, it takes us to the most basic questions about the uh, international law and about uh, international relations, as well as about the sources of legitimacy of uh, uh, authorities in different countries. I mean, who decides about uh, the legitimacy of the elections, yes? Mm -hmm. In case of Belarus, they have uh, tried to invite several uh, observers uh, to monitor the elections. Uh, unfortunately, it was impossible due to the corona crisis and uh, limitations. Uh, and then, without any evidence that the, the elections were frauded and uh, falsified, uh, a few countries and a few politicians uh, from the West declare that uh, someone else has won the elections, yes? Yeah. So, um, they, they, they don't give any evidence. I mean, there were some uh, um, exit polls as well as uh, opinion polls in Belarus, for instance, 
And uh, practically all of them, I mean, uh, those which were conveyed by professional public opinion research centers, all of them indicated that Lukashenko won the elections. Yeah. The questions were about if he got actually 80 percent or let's say 60 or 55 even, yes. Mm -hmm. And nevertheless, all even that uh, those centers were close to opposition uh, declared that according to their researchers, he has won in the first round, yes. Uh, then the opposition came out with a, uh, with a falsified, I mean, it was not even a poll, it was kind of declaration that they have made their own polls, opinion polls, uh, which indicated that uh, Tikhanovskaya got 70%. Yes, we remember that. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and, 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 and with the uh, polls from the, from the embassies in Europe and so on. Yes, yes, yes. Exactly, exactly. Uh, well, if we act like this, uh, we have, for instance, uh, you don't have... Uh, um, oh, well, okay, we can take Germany as an example. For instance, I don't know, uh, the Communist Party of Germany, yes, mm -hmm. uh, got around, I guess, uh, half percent of votes, yes, in, yes. in, in the election. Yeah, yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and and uh, uh, this is a situation similar to that if uh, someone uh, from abroad, some uh, external actor would declare that, yes, we we'll recognize the government and the chancellor coming from the, uh, the German Communist Party, yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, this would be quite similar uh, to that uh, because it's based only on the declarations uh, about uh, electoral fraud and so on because there were no observers mm -hmm. there who could uh, confirm that the, there was election fraud and so on, yes. Uh, as, and here we come to a very, very uh, important uh, question and problem, I think. Uh, actually, uh, the democracy as such is not functioning anymore. Because uh, in any country, uh, at any given point, a uh, foreign superpower might declare that, no, 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 it's our guy who won the elections. Yes, mm -hmm. not, not the one we, we dislike, but, uh, but, but the our guy uh, won the elections, even if that guy got uh, half a percent. Mm -hmm. But what is, uh, what, is, what is interesting, um, uh, since, since we are discussing this thing, uh, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, we are both uh, in the same age. Uh, I'm sure you also remember that such actions by the so-called international community were absolutely possible and successful, let us say, around 30 years ago in the 90s. And, of course, also in the Cold War times within um, the power zones of, of the two poles. It was absolutely possible totally to ignore uh, election results and uh, to, <laughs> to implement there um, the wishes uh, of, uh, of the superpower. Um, I think that we witness today really that um, this is not going to work anymore like this. We witness with uh, Syria, of course, that uh, it didn't work out so easy. And I think one of the most important events which, um, which really exposed this whole theater about the term the international community doesn't recognize this or that was the Crimean referendum. Um, I, I, I think you also remember very well. I think with the Crimean referendum, we first time saw very clearly that there is nothing like the so-called international community and that the term international community is a camouflage term for um, Washington, London and Paris. Uh, sometimes maybe Tel Aviv, yeah. But I that that we have today at least two international communities, um, maybe even more. Um, that this is really a sign of multipolarity. Also, that today um, I think uh, even the Belarusian uh, opposition recognizes if, and I think they are that realistic that they recognize that uh, it doesn't bring them just one centimeter forward. If Washington says now, um, we, uh, we say um, Lukashenko is not anymore uh, president, but uh, the opposition lady, or what do you think? I, I, I think this, this tiger of, um, 
of so-called international community, what is in reality the West, uh, is not dangerous anymore or not that dangerous as it was 30, 40 years ago? Uh, well, uh, yes, and, uh, you know, and that is quite a, a tragic fate of uh, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, who is now being recognized by some states and politicians as a president of Belarus. Uh, I remember, I always remind one story. Do you know that we have a, a government in exile of uh, Belarus since more than uh, 100 years based in uh, Canada? Y yes, and of course I did. And you know that we had uh, for decades uh, a Ukrainian exile government located in Munich. Exactly, yes. yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. But when it comes to, 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 to the Belarusian example, they, uh, their government in exile was uh, uh, formed in 1919, so just after the Bolshevik Revolution and so yeah. on. Uh, first, they got some support traditionally uh, from uh, Poland. Uh, then they got support from the Western powers. During the, the times of Cold War, they were, of course, uh, uh, sponsored by some uh, Western circles and so on. And they are still existing, actually. It would be interesting to look at a conflict of legitimacies between uh, uh, the <laughs> leaders, yes, the leaders of, of the government uh, in exile and of the president. Uh, yes. In exile, Tihanovska. Yes. yes. Uh, why I'm talking uh, about the fate, the tragic fate of uh, Tihanovska, and I, I claim that it will be a tragic fate be because this poor woman uh, probably did not uh, understand uh, what is what she is doing now. Yes, and uh, she met a lot of you know head of, heads of states, ministers, and so on. She must be really impressed of uh, what is going on around. Uh, she got some advice from uh, Bernard Henri, Henri Lévy, the, the most uh, influential, I think, of all those ideologies of uh, color revolutions all around the world. And uh, she thinks of herself as a real political figure, yes? Uh, while uh, actually, actually, I think that... Uh, in uh, several months, no one will remember about her, mm -hmm. yes, because uh, this is not only the matter of recognizing the democratic results of elections, this is also the matter of recognizing reality. Yeah, the it reality is exactly the point. Don't you yeah. have the impression that the West is hosting something like, well, let me call it a geopolitical mental hospital? You know, uh, you know these uh, stories and movies about mental hospitals where <laughs> where guys are running around who think they are Napoleon or Cleopatra, but that the contemporary West is hosting something like a mental geopolitical hospital with a lot of governments and presidents and deputies who are non-stop encouraged to believe that they are presidents, uh, governments, and, and, and deputies, but in reality, they are completely powerless, so powerless that even the own opposition in their countries wouldn't take them as a leadership or even recognizing them as a kind of important political player. Exactly. There was a very interesting and lengthy interview of Alexander Lukashenko for the Russian media. And uh, in uh, this interview, he openly stated that, uh, well, he is ready for a dialogue with the opposition. He is ready to start uh, the uh, changes and the transformation of the Belarusian political system. And he named uh, the circles which could be perceived by, by him and by the authorities as partners. Of course, uh, Tikhanovskaya and her people excluded themselves from being partners in this of this dialogue, mm -hmm. yes, because they uh, well, they they think of themselves as legal authorities of Belarus, yes? So any dialogue between them and uh, the, the authorities, uh, the uh, Lukashenko people and administration, uh, become now impossible. That's why Lukashenko openly claimed that he is going to talk to the workers, to the collectives and uh, organizations of the workers from uh, big factories in Belarus, uh, with their representatives, that he is going to uh, talk to the uh, representatives of uh, students' uh, unions, 
and uh, many, many other, uh, let's say, social groups there and the representatives of those groups, but not with uh, Tikhanovska, yes, because she is now, well, um, probably also among the opposition, as you have noticed, she will be perceived as a kind of, uh, well, political freak, yeah, right yes. now. Uh, completely uh, deprived of any contact with uh, the reality, the political reality on the ground in Belarus. Uh, so that is that is her tra tragedy, I think. But, uh, well, she has, uh, we have already talked about that, that, that uh, she has admitted that she doesn't have an idea about politics and economy and a lot of things yes <laughs> yeah. but i mean i mean that is that is really an interesting point and should be also for the future a warning to any country in the world that those candidates who are supported by the west against the legal government are almost always going the path to be groomed to be a super freak at the end you know i mean i mean that is um, it's 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 like almost like a human sacrifice because I don't believe that uh, people uh, such as uh, Tikhanovskaya or, or or any other opposition people after that kind of treatment um, will ever be able to play an important role. I mean, beside of being maybe a head of some NGO or so, okay but uh, a real role in a legal government um, uh, that they might share the fate with these exile governments sitting somewhere in Canada, in Munich, in London, or, or wherever. So, so, so is, yes, is, yes. isn't that a lecture, yes? And you know, and, and they will beg for some uh, funding from, from, from different NGOs, Western NGOs, yes? Uh, if you look at the uh, Belarusian government in exile, uh, well, they, they have nothing now, yes? Of course, yeah. officially, they call themselves the members of the government, or uh, Rada, as it's called in uh, Belarusian. Nevertheless, uh, they have literally nothing because no one needs them anymore, yes? And uh, this will be the, probably the same fate with uh, Tikhanovska, unfortunately for her. Uh, so, uh, by, uh, by agreeing for for such a scenario, uh, by listening to um, uh, Henri Lévy and uh, people like that, uh, she destroyed any prospects for her future political career. I totally agree with you. Exactly, and if we if we go deeper, and I mean, um, I think um, the interested part of our audience they they might know about uh, Henri Lévy, let's call him BHL, so that's more, more, more easy for me. Um, and um, you know that BHL, he is called a philosopher and an intellectual and so on, but I'm, I don't know if you saw, for example, the debate some months ago between uh, BHL and the Russian uh, philosopher Alexander Dugin. Um, did, you, did you see did you see this event? Of course, of course. I mean, he was. Uh, it, it was. It, it was a knockdown for for BHL. It was. It was BHL goes with a screwdriver to a pistol duel. You know that yes, was that is, was yes. like it. So BHL is himself a freak. Yeah, and I mean, you have to imagine that in the whole West and in Western Europe, Alexander Dugin is called a lot of names, really bad names. They call him fascist, they call him crazy and so on. But I strongly believe that even those who call him the worst names, they can find, still have to, have to admit that uh, BHL from the first second to the very last second didn't have even... Well, the chance of a chance to to stand against Dugin. So, um, isn't the problem that those who are grooming the freaks in these countries are um, the freaks themselves, and that the West has um, obviously no immune system or no defense system to prevent freaks getting into decisive positions? May it be in media, may it be in the academic circles, may it be in politics. So that the problem of Belorussia, now what is not really a problem of them, because <laughs> Tikhanovska is no state guest in Lithuania, but that is, it only reflects um, the systematic problem of the West. Yes, I totally agree. So, 
uh, well, the, 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 the intellectual level of uh, all those people uh, is uh, unfortunately adjusted to the falling intellectual level of uh, large parts of Western societies, yes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, still some people in the West, uh, we are not talking, of, of course, about uh, well-educated and uh, politically conscious people as, as our listeners are, but uh, still uh, lots of people in the West uh, believe that such, uh, let's say, so-called uh, political philosophers as uh, BHL are really, you know, inventing new ideas and uh, revealing the truth about uh, uh, politics and uh, uh, social sciences. Yes. So, so this is uh, this is the problem of, of Western societies. I mean, how how low we have fallen as societies that uh, guys like BHL and uh, all these very simple uh, PR tricks used uh, also in the Belarusian case. Uh, still seem to be effective. Yes, this is uh, something which, uh, well, uh, makes me very pessimistic about about, about the future of, of our societies as well. Yes, I, I, I absolutely agree because when when I followed you know, the case of Belarus, I I had always the impression, okay, they somehow, okay, they are under a tremendous pressure, but they know somehow to deal with it. But um, the real problem I saw is the West, because um, there we, and when I say we, I don't mean you and me and our super smart and educated uh, audience, but I mean with we, the West obviously totally lost um, the talent um, to distinguish the idiot from the intellectual. Yeah? And, uh, well... Uh we have also lost uh, uh, the ability to uh, define what is real and what is not real to uh, a kind of you know fundamental feeling of uh, realism in uh, in politics yes mm -hmm. and uh, that's why people are really i mean for instance in warsaw uh, tikhanovskaya has just visited warsaw a few days ago and uh, in warsaw she can you imagine that she She gave a lecture at, at Warsaw University, uh, you know, and the students applauded her and so on. And uh, people who, well, who normally can be perceived as uh, high-level uh, scholars, intellectuals, were were also present there. Yes, I mean, mm. some some of the Polish professors applauding her, uh, regardless of the fact that that she she has said nothing interesting, literally nothing interesting. Um, at, at her lecture at the, at the university, yes. So, so this is something shocking, uh, and uh, well, this uh, began long time ago. It reminds me a little bit the speeches of uh, Dalai Lama. Who, <laughs> yes, yes, exactly, clouded, yes, exactly. Yes, yes. Uh, talking, you know, uh, the, the the most. Uh, simple, even not simple, simplistic uh, things, yes, very in, a, in mm -hmm. a very primitive way. Just, you know, we all want peace and democracy and so on, mm -hmm. and the applaudisments uh, yes. followed. Get, so, get, so. get up in the morning with a smile and the day is your friend. Wow, yes, that, was, yes, exactly. that was so deep, that was so deep. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 This is the same style, yes? Yeah. And this is another uh, indication that, uh, another evidence that uh, Unfortunately, we are falling down and down, and uh, uh, well, the only the only hope is uh, in the alternative world, uh, the alternative world which is uh, created by some single thinkers and uh, uh, authors, uh, also in the West, of course. But uh, uh, this is also why we have to really. Uh, watch and listen uh, the realist stance which is taken, for instance, by such countries as uh, Russia or China. Yeah, this is also why we do this podcast, so we don't become mad at the end. Yes, <laughs> because <laughs> because because otherwise we would have declared ourselves already to the presidents of uh, Germany and Poland, and would sit together in Casablanca making contracts and declaring war against each other, as as we as we feel in the morning. 
You have just uh, you have just uh, found a great idea for <laughs> yes for yeah. our future yes so yes uh, being being permanent state guest of the King of Morocco. This program was presented to you by Manuel Oxenreiter and Mateusz Piskorski, the hardest dissident who won't violate any time the global rules against racism, extremism, or any other bad isms.